Well, and let us get started. Uh, let me begin by thanking our distinguished uh, attendees for joining this event. Um, this is part, oh, by the way, I'm Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of HRNK, the Washington DC based US Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Um, I am delighted that tonight we're launching the second in a three um, report series dedicated to uh, understanding the, the information environment of North Korea. And this report addresses a very important topic, the circulation of information within the KPA, the Korean People's Army. Let me begin by saying that it has been a tremendous pleasure working with uh, George Hutchinson, a distinguished scholar. I surely hope uh, George, that this is just the first of many reports that you'll be authoring for HRNK. Let me uh, let me uh, begin with some acknowledgments up front, George, if that's okay with you. Uh, of course, today I'm very happy that uh, I see Bob Collins, our report author and senior advisor, has joined us. David Maxwell, uh, HRNK board member, is with us. John Dupre, HRNK uh, board member and co vice chair of the board, is with us. Let me go very quickly through a list of names of those who have been uh, truly dedicated and helpful in uh, assisting with completion of this report. Of course, there are our board members who um, acted as reviewers, Dr. Nick Eberstadt at AEI, Ambassador Robert Joseph, uh, Dr. Mark Noland um, at the Peterson Institute. Uh, Raymond Ha uh, has played a, an extraordinarily important role in this project. So did our colleague, uh, Do Hyun Kim. In South Korea, George, you ran this project and you ran interviews on the COVID under extraordinarily strict lockdowns. You couldn't practically go from uh, Gyeonggi-do to Seoul. Uh, Mr. Chung Kwang il of No Chain was uh, extraordinarily helpful in um, enabling us to make those interviews happen. And of course, uh, Bob Collins uh, was very supportive. Um, all of us are, are great friends. Um, of course, it's important to thank all of the North Korean escapees who helped out with this project, our interns and consultants, Dileta De Luca, Claire McBree, and of course, Rosa Park, um, Tokola, all of them have uh, made extraordinary contributions. Um, that said, um, I uh, am absolutely delighted to uh, introduce our report author and uh, keynote speaker today. George Hutchinson um, well performs many important roles. He's of course, managing editor of the International Journal of Korean Studies. He's a board member of the International Council on Korean Studies. Uh, he's also a senior regional planner with Secure Defense Incorporated. He supports and advises the US Air Force on military basing issues in South Korea, in the Republic of Korea. Um, George is a great American and a great scholar. He has previously served for over a quarter century, over 25 years, as both an officer and non-commissioned officer in uh, the US Air Force. He's a, a brilliant Korean linguist, speaks uh, flawless Korean. Uh, his writings have been published in the International Journal of Korean Studies, the US Naval, Institute Proceedings and the Air Force Journal of Logistics. Uh, the, the list could certainly go on and on. He's right now very close to completion of his PhD at uh, George Mason University. Uh, George, I'm going to stop here, uh, turn it over to you. So, uh, sir, you're at the controls. Please go ahead. Well, thank you, Executive Director Scarlett. You appreciate it, Greg. Good evening. And good morning to you from, uh, from here in Korea. And thanks for everybody for, for joining today. Of course, big thanks to HRNK for the research opportunity. It was great working with the, with the, with the staff. Um, and I'm so glad to be here to share the results with you today. So going back to 
the point when we initially started thinking about a framework and a, and a methodology for this report because information you know, is somewhat esoteric. So we're, we're working closely with Raymond Ha and Do Hyun Kim back in the October, November, 2020 timeframe. And there had been a relatively recent episode in North Korea previously that April. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but not long after the COVID outbreak, Kim Jong-un had gone missing. He'd missed several high profile public events. And for about a month, this generated quite a bit of media interest. There was, there was a lot of media clickbait. Was he incapacitated? Had he undergone surgery? Uh, was he recovering? Was he gravely ill? And then seemingly as quickly as the story erupted, it ended literally the following month when there were pictures of him at a ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, and just like that, speculation ended, the story went away. And so we're brainstorming and we're reflecting on that episode. And it got us to thinking, you know, now we may never fully know what caused Kim's disappearance that April, but for that brief period, planners, policy practitioners, decision makers, career watchers, we're seriously revisiting and gaming out the what ifs involving the stability of the regime, along with the attendant risks, all the responses, the courses of action and so on. So the range of variables that could cause instability in North Korea are numerous, could be natural, could be unnatural, could be weather related, could be a Chernobyl sized event. But and there's a, there's a number of intervening variables here in Northeast Asia. And the sobering reality with this is that due to the highly vertical nature uh, and closed off nature of communication channels in the Korean People's Army, the KPA, any destabilization that ruptures the ability for the Supreme Command and Control Node to issue orders downward would res to the KPA, which is large and, and well-armed, um, it could result in a potential you know, very dangerous, unpredictable outcome. So it's important to think about because there's, a, there's almost sort of a complacency that sets in, almost a reversed form of the thinking from the 1990s when much of the establishment was convinced that the collapse of the Kim regime at that point was imminent. And policy sort of dragged along because folks were just waiting for it to happen. And now we fast forward to 2022, and it's the Kim regime's ability to resiliently muddle through crises that's produced this new sort of reverse complacency of sorts. And that's this passive assumption over the indelibility of the regime, the ability of the regime to essentially muddle through in perpetuity. And so if the Kim regime if, if this April Kim Jong-un going missing did anything, it served to remind us, particularly those in the relevant agencies and organizations, the folks to think about this stuff, not only the importance of maintaining contingency awareness, but due to the high stakes involved, a reminder of how important it is to understand the potential communication pathways capable of getting into the KPA in the event the regime breaks down. And lines of communication are important for you know, not only security reasons, but for humanitarian reasons as well. So first, uh, to you know, prevent the KPA from inadvertent or unnecessary employment of force in a, in a regime breakdown scenario, especially weapons of mass destruction, but also to facilitate humanitarian assistance operations or depending on the situation, for potentially sustaining defensive resistance type operations. And so there's a broad need across multiple agencies and stakeholders to find ways to inform the KPA soldier at the unit level about the real world situation going on around them and any humanitarian help that may be on the way. So that takes us to the purpose of the report. So in order to get at these pathways, to the KPA, we've got to understand how information is processed in the KPA. So we already have a pretty good idea of, of the top to bottom, the vertical flow, orders flow down, information flows up, very little information shared horizontally, but much less is known about the day-to-day -day information practices, the processes, 
the procedures used uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by KPA soldiers at the unit level. So to get after this gap in understanding, we interviewed 16 former KPA soldiers, all with different experiences, a uh, tremendous variety of experiences, actually. The, uh, no Chain did a, did a phenomenal job getting us the interviewees. And uh, so we, we spoke with them to, to begin to get a better understanding of the types and characteristics of information, the technologies, the systems, procedures, uh, access and control, um, organizations involved in the dissemination of information, and, and not only how KPA soldiers process day-to-day -day related information, but also how foreign outside information is accessed and consumed. So, We've got findings and recommendations uh, and some observations based on the interview. But before, uh, before I go into that, I just wanna, I wanna explain the structure of the report a little bit. The report, it starts off by putting a, a problem statement in front of the reader that underscores the Kim Dynasty's unique and defiant form of resilience. This is, this is sort of an important concept to get out front. It's this chronic ability to survive, so to speak. And it goes back, it goes back to that fateful year in 1989, where North Korea has experienced international isolation, international sanctions, disastrous economic failures, a great famine, and then subsequently recurring food shortages, widespread malnutrition, weather-related catastrophes, floods, you name it. Um, all of this has been going on during this period, and this, and this is a period spanning two hereditary transfers of, of power. And so this paycheck to paycheck ability to survive is in large part due to the absolute control that the Suryong, the supreme leader through the party, the Korean Workers' Party, wields over society and particularly control over the information that society is given access to and, and controlled by. And so this section closes with a warning that this tight control that has allowed North Korea to hopscotch from disaster to disaster, it's this continued tightening that we see over the last year, especially this burdensome control that actually causes the regime to remain highly vulnerable, especially to outside information. So should the regime unsuccessfully withstand shocks to its structure for whatever reason? Again, natural, unnatural. And then factoring in the KPA against this backdrop, there's a, a countless number of unsettling scenarios that can unfold. And so what is this control? And so the next section explains this system, this system of monolithic control that's been honed over the years that gives the Suryong, the Supreme Leader, unchallenged power and control over the masses. Now, would it not be for the insidiously repressive characteristics of the system? It's frankly, brilliantly engineered. It's a brilliantly engineered system of total control. You've got a dynastic autocratic ruler with uh, his own copyrighted brand of ideology, Juche conveniently implemented through a single political faction, the Korean Workers Party, uh, upon which he sits atop. And with its own mandatory code of loyalty for North Korean people to live by the 10 principles of monolithic ideology, which of course is monitored and enforced through the practice of mandatory self-criticism sessions, Sangwa Chongwa, where, where ordinary North Koreans, as we all know, are required to demonstrate this rote understanding of the 10 principles and, and can be held uh, as, as uh, being treasonous if, if they can't. And so all of this is managed, of course, and, and executed in a society cleaved up into the three classes, the Sungwin system, which is engineered to keep power and control in the hands of the elite few. And again, it's an insidiously brilliant uh, system that's, uh, continues to try and build a, a, a coup-proof aspect to itself that weights, that inadvertently weights it down. And it's within this system of control that Kim Jong-un has brought back the party Congress. 
this five-year party congress previously used by his grandfather to manage and implement control uh, across down throughout the party apparatus right down to the neighborhood unit and what we saw at the eighth party congress back in january 2021 kim jong-un uh, admitted to complete failure at achieving north korea's economic objectives but rather than proposing uh reform or, or pragmatic approaches to improving the economy, he instead stressed going back to the old ways of self-reliance to further centralize the economy and increase control. And in conjunction with this increased control, Kim Jong-un mobilized the entire party apparatus to launch a rather draconian three-pronged campaign to tighten, to further tighten the party screw on the North Korean people. And prong one, of course, is the anti-reactionary thought law, the law that's intended to block the flow of outside information getting into North Korea by greatly increasing the cost to consumers of outside information up to death uh, for those who consume and distribute foreign content. Prong two is the targeting now uh, of officials suspected of corruption which includes, and this is in the KPA, it includes a new organization to strengthen party control over the military. Uh, the military government guidance department was stood up last year to do this. And then there's a third prong, and that, that's this drastic effort to seal the borders, which we've all read about. Uh, a clear target of this, this, this three-pronged campaign is outside information. And why? because it threatens the regime. And the KPA is affected by each prong in this campaign. And so how and why is this? Well, we look at this in the, in the next section. We, uh, we look at the KPA as an organization and how, how that organization is sort of symbiotically tethered to uh, the Sudion. And the, the KPA, is, it's a massive human assemblage, uh, especially due to its large reserves and paramilitary. So North Korea pours about 25% of its GDP into annual military expenditures, and that puts it on top, uh, first among 169 countries in the world. Kim Jong-un, three hats. He's the chairman of the State Affairs Commission, chairman of the Korean Workers' Party, chairman of the Central Military Commission. And what this does is this, this gives him total operational, political, and administrative control over the KPA. And then what this results in at the unit level, and this is something that, uh, that Robert Collins has written about, is this triple reporting system where the commander at each level, uh, at each echelon in the KPA is flanked on either side, two separate chains of oversight. One's the political officer from the General Political Bureau, the other is the security officer from the Military Security Command, and in the middle, um, you know, uh, of, of all of this is, is the military officer. So three chains with separate reporting chains, separate reporting chains, essentially, that all go up to the uh, organization and guidance department. And, and this, is, this is clearly designed as a, as a coup proof mechanism for the Sudion. Uh, but it's got the KPA officer who we're trying to get to here, uh, right in the middle of this, in this tight vertical communication arrangement. And so we go on, we go on to characterize KPA force disposition and end the section by covering the most common disciplinary problems in the KPA, uh, most of which are typical of, of disciplinary problems, things you'd find probably in any, any military. Uh, uh, so alcohol abuse, uh, assault, desertion, these are they're very common problems, uh, mishandling of classified information. But one is atypical, and that's accessing South Korean or other foreign information. And this is considered one of the major disciplinary problems that's emerged in the KPA. And so significant efforts now uh, are going into stemming this uh, by intensifying ideological indoctrination on the, on the back end and on the front end, um, working with recruits to try and cleanse them uh, prior to them actually stepping into the, uh, the military. So here's some observations, findings, uh, recommendations. We'll start off with observations first based on the interviews. So 16 interviews, 
of course, all had KPA experience. Ages ranged from 21 to 57, average age being about 35. And so of the 16, three were female. KPA service years among the group, uh, as far as a range of, of service covered from 1979 to 2019, so 40 years. All major service branches of the KPA were represented uh, except the Strategic Force Command. So these were unit soldiers. So their ranks at the end of their active commitment were primarily enlisted. Uh, but there were, there were a few company grade officers as well um, and a highly diverse group, you know, different military specialties, uh, all coming, uh, so coming from eight different provinces and, and Pyongyang, including Pyongyang. So four of them served in frontline units along the DMZ, and one served as a border guard along the Sino-Korean border uh, near uh, Huayong. So first, okay, some, some observations, general observations. Vertical information flow. We absolutely immediately confirm the vertical nature of information flow in the KPA, and this stands out. So annually around November, the general staff department issues a training order down. It goes down, it's on behalf of the Supreme Leader. And this sets the battle rhythm uh, for the year. So all the training timelines, doctrine guidelines for the upcoming year. And then, so, so this becomes a standard plan that's iterated uh, daily up and down this vertical communications channel with task direction that flows down from general staff department to the various echelons uh, core, division, brigade, regiment, battalion, companies. So the former KPA that we spoke with were mostly familiar with the processes at the company and battalion level. So uh, in, this, in this vertical alignment, so companies will send a daily task report back up through this chain for approval, uh, and then new orders flow down to the unit to execute the following day. So it's rather regimented. The uh, and political indoctrination materials flow down in a similar fashion, but they come from the General Political Bureau in printed form, and this is on a weekly basis. All standard content across the KPA gets sorted and, uh, and delivered by unit messengers from the higher echelons down to the company level. And at the company level, it's the company political officer. They get the materials, they sign for them, and then they use them for the week's political indoctrination sessions. Technology. Pretty low tech. Uh, it's, it's coming along, but the KPA has not advanced much over the decades. They, they still use a lot of legacy equipment and they use messengers uh, extensively to deliver bulk printed materials from higher echelons all the way down to the, uh, to the, to the, to the company level. So the KPA, it, they, they have a, an intranet, so documents can be emailed, but through the interviews, it was apparent that the internet is not deployed at scale throughout the KPA. Uh, and, and certainly most soldiers don't have access. So select individuals with uh, very specific administrative duties and usually those with, with some rank uh, have access to use systems, but it's not widely deployed. Um, and also uh, some material can be distributed in ebook form and electronic data can be transferred back and forth using encrypted USB drives. But this too, this didn't appear to be a widespread spread practice. And again, particularly among the, uh, the soldiers, the folks that we're trying to communicate with here. So landline phones, Morris radio systems used to transmit sensitive information, but again, only designated individuals use these systems. Officers down to the company level, have access to cell phones, but these these aren't not connected to the to the broader civilian network. They're they're indigenous to the KPA, but the phones um, again they 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 appear to exclude use by the common KPA soldier. Video uh, there is video conferencing, video calls at least down to the regiment level. Uh, so regiment commanders will attend video conferences hosted at the division level. So there's technology out there and it's being used, uh, but in a very controlled way and not widely available, certainly not to the average KPA soldier. It's a one, one escapee summed it up saying, you know, on the one hand, the KPA just simply doesn't have the funding uh, or inventory to access 
sophisticated communications technology. But on the other hand, he explained that within the KPA, it's, it's recognized that rather than this being a weakness, uh, the view is that the reliance on conventional methods like messengers, landlines, more systems are actually a strength, uh, you know, a tactic that provides uh, sort of a, an asymmetric advantage because it makes it more difficult for its communications to be exploited. So horizontal communications, uh, this we also confirmed that there's, there's virtually no horizontal communication between KPA units. Communication strictly compartmentalized even at the battalion level. So uh, horizontal communications can occur, they do occur uh, during joint training exercises, um, things of that nature, units will come in contact with one, one another, but in terms of day-to-day -day coordination, there's virtually none. KPA structure. So within a typical KPA unit, little's changed over the decades in terms of structure. So all aspects of a soldier's life are heavily regulated. Manuals and regulations that uh, are published, that are distributed, they come down from the Ministry of Defense. They provide the framework for schedules, roles, uh, and responsibilities for, for, the, for the members of the unit. The chief master sergeant of the unit usually oversees the administrative matters, and the company commander uh, at the company level will direct training activity. Two formations are generally held each day, one in the morning, one in the evening, with uh, sometimes frequent inspections that, that can occur throughout the day. Part of the daily schedule can be applied to non-military duties, economic activities, uh, construction, farming, uh, that type of thing. But the interviewees that we spoke with said that mo most of the time is, is spent on tasks directly related to their military duty and, and political indoctrination. And so political indoctrination. Indoctrination is for all intents and purposes, it's, it's the central feature to the life of a KPA soldier. So two hours of mandatory indoctrination each day. And going, you know, going into this, I, I you know, knew that there was indoctrination. I, I just didn't realize how uh, strictly that it's enforced. So two hours up to six days a week. Um, and the two hours of indoctrination each day that have been institutionalized occur between roughly nine and 11 o'clock in the morning. And, and that's apparently when, when the mind is most alert. So over the course of their service in the KPA, a soldier will receive about 10,000 hours of indoctrination. And, and as one former KPA, and uh, Raymond will, will remember this, uh, one former KPA explained, he told us that Given 10,000 hours of indoctrination or, or anything, uh, lies can be transformed into truths quite easily. And so through the interviews, we learned that political indoctrination has, has actually intensified in recent years. So in large part, and th this is due to the conscripts uh, that are being clamped down on now for having greater exposure to South Korean and other foreign content before entering the KPA. Corruption, we discussed corruption. So former KPA who served from the 80s through the early 2000s to a person, all reported that there, there was virtually no corruption in the KPA. Um, beginning in the mid 2000s, corruption appears to become widespread in the KPA. Bribes, extortion, siphoning of supplies, uh, favoritism, exempting certain subordinates from military duty to use them as full-time runners, you know, personal errand runners and so on. So previously, uh, according to the older set of KPA interviewees, the, these are acts that would have been caught uh, by the you know, political officer or by uh, someone in the chain, and they would have been reported. But by the mid 2000s, this type of information uh, can be suppressed, and, and usually by offering bribes. So one escapee mentioned that corruption had become so normalized uh, 
that if there, there were to be a crackdown on corruption, the state wouldn't be able to continue functioning. And, th and this is, you know, it's interesting to hear, considering that Kim Jong-un's campaign, uh, one, of the, one of the prongs in this campaign is to crack down on corruption. So as, as the veil of COVID lifts over the next year, it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. Okay, so we, so we looked at KPA access to outside information as well. Um, escapees with recent KPA experience from the mid 2000s onward indicated that most, if not all recruits entering the KPA have been exposed to foreign content, especially K-pop, South Korean songs, K-dramas, uh, all, all the way in. And so the KPA, of course, recognizes this and, and they handle this when the recruits now enter basic training. The recruits are required to come out with a full confession. They have to make a list of all the impure content that they've either seen or heard, been exposed to primarily South Korean, uh, South Korean, US and Japanese content is the target. And they're told that if they're honest, they'll be forgiven. Uh, and so they also, they also have to name names. And, and, and this is a, a way that so others can be possibly questioned. And of course, this, this puts the recruit in the classic prisoner's dilemma um, and it's uh, you know another insidiously brilliant way to to try and control. So exposure to outside information while serving in the KPA varied, particularly depending on the interviewee's age, when they served, and where they served. Uh, it was remarkably different, actually, in the in their viewpoints uh, about outside content. So, so interviewees who served close to the DMZ were exposed to leaflets and loudspeakers. Um, and they have you know, different, different set of views on that. The one station near the Sino-North Korean border as a border guard was, was living large. You know, he had access to radio broadcasts and through the interactions with civilians in the area, could access CDs, USB devices, could plug those into notels and CD players. Uh, and interestingly, those who served in units in Pyongyang seemed to have the easiest access to outside information. So they listened, they had access, easy access to devices, they had easy access to content. So they listened to K-pop using MP4 players, watched uh, K-dramas using mobile phones with SD cards uh, loaded with content. So we found that higher ranking soldiers, usually those in the last couple years of service, they're the ones that have more opportunities to access content because they can go off base where they where they cannot access content in private homes. And so uh, for the more junior soldiers, unless unless their specific occupation takes them off base, like a driver, uh, for instance, or to get or someone in the in the uh, supply corps to get supplies. Uh, the more junior soldiers are pretty much confined to base, again, unless, unless their uh, occupations take them off base. And so they have far fewer opportunities to access content. So rank and type of occupation uh, are determinants that shape access to outside information. Now, how does content get into North Korea? So no surprise, you know, according to the interviewees, most of the outside information gets in because it's smuggled from China. But this comes at a cost because up to 30% of smuggling profits goes to the border guards. And so, and, and this activity is probably tapering uh, right now because of the crackdown. But, um, and this was, you know, according to the interviewees, uh, the smugglers are, are pretty much beholden to the border guards and the border guards do well. Uh, KPA soldiers vie to become border guards because of this. So now some content is, is also picked up by fishermen uh, and, and passed along. They have their own networks uh, involving getting things to markets. So interestingly, we found that markets which had sprung up uh, in the early 2000s 
and, and, and afterwards, we're no longer playing, this is uh, surprising, we're, we're no longer playing a robust role in the distribution of content, whereas previously they had. So apparently it's become too risky uh, and content now, once smuggled in, is usually distributed within personal networks of trust. So the KPA does work now to counter foreign content through political indoctrination surveillance by the military security officers. And of course, KPA soldiers across the board are, are still taught that leaflets and other materials that are ballooned in um, are booby trapped. They'll explode or they're laced with uh, poison. Uh, one of the interviewees told a, a, an interesting, a, a funny story about um, how he would use pigs to test whether or not ramen was uh, poisonous or, or whether the socks had been laced with uh, poison. He would have the pigs wear socks and if they, the, their feet didn't rot, then he would, he would use them. Um, so now the KPA uses informants. Uh, so every squad within a platoon has an informant that reports to a security officer and the soldiers don't know who the informants are, uh, obviously. So uh, there's also, there's ad hoc raids being conducted of officers' homes, um, the officers that live off base. So all the interviewees agreed that getting caught with outside content would be treated severely, uh, particularly if they were caught by you know those that are you know uh, are preoccupied with that uh, that that's their duty you know to to surveil, um, and and particularly if it involves higher ranking individuals. But at the same time, they gave examples, uh, many examples, where bribes were used by soldiers to get out of trouble when they were caught with content, and so. We asked uh, the interviewees their opinion on the best ways to get information into the KPA, and we got a variety of uh, viewpoints. Now, some favor technology. Uh, there were some that favored devices that could easily be concealed or discarded, SD cards, USBs, and so on. One interviewee made uh, the interesting point that unlike the rest of society, Military members, when they're off base, are not the targets of street inspections. So uh, KPA soldiers are pretty much left alone when they're off base. It's and even though it's against regulation for a KPA to, you know, soldier to own a device, many secretly do. And so it would be best to focus on getting information to residents living near military bases you know, if to effectuate getting uh, information into the KPA, since it's easier for soldiers to access content off base. But interestingly, others, uh, even the younger former KPA, um, they were in favor of leaflets, since uh, logically leaflets can reach the 70 to 80% of the KPA that's deployed forward uh, near the DMZ. And so we asked how exposure to outside information influenced their decision to escape North Korea. And of the 16, five said that outside information directly influenced their decision to escape North Korea while they were in the KPA. Uh, interestingly, three of those five served in frontline areas along the DMZ which for us underscored the power of leaflets counterintuitively. And so uh, another six indicated that outside information encountered either before or after their service in the KPA affected their decision to escape. So roughly two thirds uh, were, were affected uh, and influenced by outside information. Five of the 16 uh, did say that outside information had no effect on their decision. And so I uh, assumed that maybe those were the older KPA. And so I went back and there, there weren't. Uh, these, these uh, it was pretty much uh, a, a bell curve on, on the five that, uh, that said information had no effect. So one third, no effect, two thirds had an effect. Um, I'd like to get to some findings now. And uh, this is, I'm gonna try and share my screen if, uh, if I could. Let me see real quick. OK. 
Can everybody see that? This is just to pop up what I've got. Okay, so um, the Kim regime, this is what we found. So, and, and the Kim regime generally loathes outside information, uh, but, but is far more sensitive to South Korean cultural content getting into North Korea. And, and we see this manifested in the extreme penalties found in the anti-reactionary thought law. Uh, North Koreans can be sent, so there's a death penalty uh, for uh, wide scale distribution of content, but North Koreans can also be sent now to a labor camp uh, simply for writing, speaking, or singing like a South Korean. Um, also, we can say with relative confidence that access to outside information, which has steadily increased over the years, pre-COVID anyway, plays an important role influencing KPA soldiers. And, and this is why the regime and the KPA have taken recent steps to curb the inflow and access of dis distribution of outside content. Uh, but the problem for the uh, regime is th there's, a, there's a generation of KPA soldiers that have been exposed to foreign content already. That's already occurred. So an excessive crackdown on this generation could have uh, you know, backlash effects. Third, uh, despite the pre-COVID proliferation of outside information getting into North Korea, getting information directly into the KPA remains challenging. So the structural limitations posed by the, the system, the vertical flow you know, of information, the, the lack of sharing information horizontally, the use of older conventional methods uh, used to transmit information, the, the triple reporting system, and now uh, this increased scrutiny of uh, conscripts entering, um, the intensification of ideological indoctrination, all, all of this combines to make it very difficult to get information into the KPA. But while limitations exist, it is still possible to get information into the KPA. And, and this is what we found out based on our interviews. And it was apparent that certain military units have fewer restrictions and have easier access, frankly, to getting outside content. KPA assigned to Pyongyang uh, and those in the Air Force and Naval Forces seem to have much easier, uh, a much easier time. And, uh, and, it, and it, frankly, it seemed, they, they seem to be less indoctrinated, uh, to be honest, uh, when, when, we, when we interviewed them. The ground units uh, appear to be uh, managed more tightly. And so KPA soldiers, uh, also KPA soldiers with off-base access have a clear advantage where they receive less scrutiny uh, from state security services and they can access content from civilians. So there, there is a way to do this. Finding for leaflets, uh, counterintuitively, leaflets are effective. They see, you know, leaflets appear, it's they're passe. Uh, they've been used for years. But it was surprising to hear, especially from the younger KPA, that uh, about the how they felt in terms of the authenticity and the effectiveness of, of leaflets. Uh, and, and three of the, of the four said they were influenced directly by the leaflets. So messaging, um, messaging. So we got this, we got this from uh, a few of the interviewees and it resonated with, with Raymond and I uh, during the interviews. In terms of messaging, what came through from these interviews was KPA soldiers receive a tremendous amount of ideological indoctrination. So disparaging messages that evoke a hostile or defensive reaction can actually serve to reinforce the regime's propaganda and, and create and confirm distrust. Uh, but factual information, helpful information that frees up thinking uh, about you know, a productive life, greater economic freedom, fairness, uh, the meaning of human rights, uh, things like that, that we were told uh, would, would resonate a lot more than, you know, derogatory, uh, you know, they like the, the, the interview, the movie, the interview. I mean, the, not, not really, if anything, it just hardens resolve and it creates uh, hostility. 
So recommendations, and these are recommendations, just general recommendations for the broader group. Uh, first is to get efforts that promote human rights in North Korea back up and reactivate it. First step uh, in the US, finally appoint a special envoy for North Korean human rights uh, at the State Department. Um, you know, what we're talking about today, the, so the, the special envoy would be in a position to consult with NGOs and provide a single channel, you know, a, a coordination uh, across the agencies that formulate policies to, to deal with issues like the one that we're talking about today and others involving human rights in North Korea. Uh, and in South Korea, of course, reactivate the, no the North Korean Human Rights Act of 2016. The anti-leaflet law. So the ROC government, hopefully as uh, the UN administration gets underway here, should consider promptly rescinding or modifying at least the anti-leaflet law that went into effect last year. And, you know, this, this is the law that... Uh, came into effect after Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, threatened South Korea over the leaflet situation. And so the irony is, is obvious that, uh, you know, when freedoms of, of expression of speech are repressed in the South to avoid offending the regime in the North, while it represses its own people, uh, yeah, it's, there's tragic irony there. And adding to this tragic fact that many of the uh, folks being repressed in the South are actually former North Korean, or they're former North Koreans the, that, uh, that risked everything essentially to escape from the North. So um, third, humanitarian campaigns moving forward, campaigns, influence operations, uh, actually devising you know, the, the campaigns and, and creating content with themes and messaging um, should consider messaging and content that are, that are, that are more carefully uh, planned moving forward. And, and where I'm going with this is thought and care should go into a next generation thinking uh, for the design, particularly of leaflets, uh, keeping in mind that 70 to 80% of the KPA is forward deployed along the DMZ. And in the event of a contingency, it's these soldiers to whom vital information should be prioritized, you know, but in a way that inspires and encourages them uh, without inciting ideological resentment. And I think this is very important. And uh, I think more should be looked into how, how the messaging and content flows. Fourth, um, consider putting more thought and consideration into alternative pathways for information insertion. So the areas that we stumbled onto in the initial set of interviews was uh, that there are more lenient, uh, uh, you know, comparably, there are more lenient KPA gateways that appear in the Air Force and the Naval Forces. And the elite in Pyongyang uh, seem to have easier access due to maybe due to their status, their privileges. Um, but it's the, and it's also the West Sea fishermen and, and their unique distribution network channels. Uh, I think these are, these are just a few, uh, there's likely more. And that leads to considering uh, additional research and analysis. I, I think it would be safe to say uh, that we, we've scratched the surface with this report. Um, and uh, this final recommendation, I'd say, uh, consider maybe some more research to bookend or, or supplement this effort to yield uh, a more complete picture of information in the KPA. So that's it. Uh, thank you for listening and, uh, and look forward to your, your questions. Uh, George, thank you very much. That was a terrific expose of uh, Kim regime dynamics the politics and mechanism of oppression, and also, of course, the information environment in particular within the KPA. I think you have laid the foundation, as you said, for a, a new approach to information campaigns. There will be a post-COVID reset everywhere, including North Korea. And um, truly your observations and recommendations, your analysis will be instrumental in carving that new path. We have a question from none other than um, our distinguished board member, Professor and Colonel David Maxwell, who compliments you on a phenomenal
presentation information and thanks you for that. Um, so George, uh, this, this is coming from Dave, although beyond the scope of your research, could you shed any light on how outside information influences senior leaders? Do you think that senior leaders are similarly influenced as the rank and file soldiers? Do you think there can be any impact on senior leader decision making? Yes, and so that is the perfect segue to a next report. And maybe we need to look at that. But no, uh, Dave, excellent question. I absolutely do think that senior leaders are affected. Um, and, and there's there's evidence of this. Uh, last year, when Kim Jong-un initiated this three-pronged campaign uh, and this crackdown, uh, part of that uh, prong two, as we discussed, is the uh, targeting of officials. And the very first officials that were targeted and, uh, and, and who met the death penalty were senior KPA, I mean, well, colonels and above. And, uh, and so, and, and I, maybe the, the Colonel apparently was, was involved more in, in the distribution aspect, but if uh, what I got out of uh, the stories on this particular case was that uh, he, he apparently had a network. And so his network were, were probably other military uh, people, you know, in line with either, you know, his rank, I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, and his whatever uh, other affiliation. So yeah, absolutely, I do. I, th I think senior leaders are affected, um, and uh, you know they're 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 uh, they're likely to how how they uh, view um, the questions that you know we we ask the interviewees, the sixteen interviewees that we talk to, we'd get probably a different set of answers, I think, from senior leaders, but at the core, right, no, I, th I think they're, they're as influenced uh, as, as the folks that we spoke with. Terrific, thank you very much, George and Dave. Uh, now we, uh, we do have uh, more questions from none other than Robert Collins, HRNK author and senior advisor. Uh, the first question is, the first question from Bob, what aspect of human rights is violated the greatest during the implementation of the ideological indoctrination? Uh, the second question, with your long background in the U.S. military, how do you assess the impact of this indoctrination process on individual soldier skills? or a unit's tactical efficiency. So to sum it up, the first one, what human rights are violated through this ideological indoctrination. The second one, what is the actual impact on an individual soldier's skills or a unit's tactical efficiency on a very practical level? Right. And so those are great questions. Uh, the So the aspect of human rights that's violated greatest. So the ideological indoctrination of KPA soldiers really represents a segment of indoctrination that occurs uh, as part of the cradle to grave indoctrination machine that starts at childhood for North Koreans and continues throughout the, their entire lives. So this but not so much different from, from the, indo the indoctrination, the ideological indoctrination that, that is encountered in different phases of their life. I'd say that the, uh, the human rights that are violated, the right to free thought, opinions, expression, uh, freedom of information. Um, yeah, so, and now the second question with uh, how, how does this impact the soldier skills? and uh, tactical efficiency. This, um, I think there are two ways you could look at this. Uh, I think, you know, all militaries use doctrine to some level to affect uh, or, to, you know, to hone training and tactics, but certainly not to the level that the KPA soldier is exposed to. So, you know, the sheer volume of time that a KPA soldier spends in mandatory indoctrination sessions, it has a potent 
psychological impact on the soldier. So from the you know indoctrination, buying into the regime, being being uh, gung ho uh, about supporting the regime, um, I think you know it's probably pretty effective. But the question is the unit's tactical efficiency. And I think in terms of individual soldier skills, uh, I'd say that it harms the KPA's tactical effectiveness. I mean, they're spending two hours a day, nearly every day in a classroom setting, being told how great Kim Jong-un is when they could be out training. So, and, and this is per soldier, uh, so X number of soldiers times X number of units. So in the aggregate, you have millions of hours that are being, you know, uh, going down this, this ideological indoctrination drain. And so from a tactical effect, effectiveness standpoint, I think it can only harm uh, effectiveness. Well, thank you very much, uh, George and Bob. Um, uh, George, you've had some great words of wisdom for our friends, allies, and partners in South Korea. Uh, you have emphasized the importance of the leaflet law. Of course, there's a, a new uh, there's a new president who has just won the election. So uh, we in the human rights community expect some changes. And as you said, perhaps doing away with the leaflet law might be one of those very positive changes that would be welcomed by human rights organizations in South Korea, especially those run by North Korean escapees. Uh, of course, I would add the appointment of a South Korean ambassador for North Korean human rights. We haven't had one uh, also since 2017, fall of 2017. Um, and um, you, you emphasize the very importance of, of the, the U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights. We do need these uh, um, ambassadorial positions, as you said, to um, remind everyone of the importance of the issue. And um, again, um, you, you have pretty much come up with a roadmap that that relates to the infrastructure that we already have in place when it comes to North Korean human rights, including the U.S. North Korean Human Rights Act that is um, very close to being uh, reauthorized. Um, again, great words of wisdom for anyone involved in operations, in information operations, anyone trying to, um, to understand the information environment of North Korea. Again, you have laid the groundwork and, and have gone much deeper, actually. Um, we, I, I do hope that this is going to be just uh, one of uh, many George Hutchinson reports. Uh, what you have done has been to help us establish the organization as an organization with uh, strong credentials in this area. Next, we will have uh, a report by uh, Bob Collins, a report on the propaganda and agitation department. And these three reports that we have produced on information will hopefully provide us with a, a solid foundation to, to continue to address this very important issue. So George, uh, would you like to have any uh, brief concluding remarks? Uh, any thoughts you'd like to share with the, the participants? Well, yeah, once again, just thank you so much for coming out uh, and, and listening and great questions uh, there towards the end. Uh, looking forward, you know, to the to the next several weeks uh, to see how things transpire here in Korea. And uh, now just uh, just thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you very much, George, uh, for everything you have done for HRNK and for our mission. Thank you for your scholarship and dedication. Let me also thank our colleague Raymond Ha, not only for his contributions to the report, but also for setting up this meeting and uh, basically being in charge of the controls. And let me thank uh, everyone in attendance. You're terrific. Uh, thank you. I, I know it's perhaps not the best hour for some of you or many of you. We're very grateful that you have joined. Please stay tuned. The report is already available as a PDF file on our website hrnk.org under publications. Uh, probably tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we'll have hard copies delivered as well. So please let us know if you're interested in uh, hard copies. Of course, we'll proceed with our usual distribution. Uh, distribution. So um, 
In conclusion, uh, the timing has been very interesting, George. Today is the anniversary of the KPA, isn't it? We, uh, yeah. <laughs> Timing's everything, Greg. Uh, yes, so this is your gift to the KPA on their anniversary. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Best wishes, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Take care. Take good care. Thank you.